thank you very much for joining in such a big number. Uh, welcome in the name of the Entrepreneurial Wave. We are a group of, uh, basically just a group of entrepreneurs and startup enthusiasts uh, trying to share the knowledge. So that's why we are organizing this kind of events on a monthly basis uh, where we invite someone who has succeeded in a way in, with their own enterprise and can share some knowledge with you. Uh, but additionally, we really encourage you to also uh, talk between each other and share the knowledge among yourself because I know that a lot of you also probably have startups or work in startups and I know that a lot of you have uh, a lot of good knowledge to share. Okay, who has a startup here? Let's see. Yeah, many. Amazing. Amazing. Who, who is going to try in the next year, I would say? Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I would like to thank thanks a lot also our, to our sponsor, uh, Leap, who is an uh, agile web agency who provided this uh, place for us, the venue. Um, and I would like to welcome our guest for today, Yuri. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yuri is the co-founder of an app called maps.me. Uh, which he just updated us actually. Uh, as you've seen in our title, he, he, they used to have 25 million apps in the uh, 25 million downloads in the app stores, which is already quite a significant number. But apparently now they already reached 40 million. Yes. So <laughs> big congrats, Yuri, for that. <laughs> um, and so another thing, what we have here is the Ant Wave. Uh, it's written here also, Ant Wave, which stands for Entrepreneurial Wave. Uh, so we will see the questions on the screen and we will try to address them as soon as possible. If you don't have Twitter or if you don't want to tweet about it, just, just feel free to also raise your hand whenever you want. Uh, if you need Wi-Fi, there is Wi-Fi password here on the, on the wall on a couple of pillars over there. Uh, so feel free to connect to it. Now I'm passing the word to Nicola and Yuri for the interview. Okay, Thank thanks. You. I just need some paper from you. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, as uh, Matins mentioned already, uh, Yuri is a software engineer uh, from Belarus. So he worked previously at, uh, at Google, right? And uh, in 2010, together with some friends, uh, he founded the company uh, Maps With Me. And after in 2013, uh, also uh, increased the number of users, and he also developed a version for Yota phone that is a, a Russian smartphone that with two displays. Uh, the hub was sold to Mailru in November 2014, and uh, now, as, as you mentioned, and as you can hear already, um, there are 40,000 people using this application. Okay, uh, let's start. Could you briefly introduce <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? 40 million. 40 million, sorry. <laughs> How many I say? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's the way I think, actually, but this is a, a step further. <laughs> uh, yeah, could you briefly introduce Maps with me? Uh, so, Maps with me, and, or we renamed this later to Maps.me, uh, is an application that displays maps using both the street map data, and it works smoothly without internet connection. Okay. So, what was your initial idea of the application? Well, uh, I'm originally from Belarus, and uh, back then there was no decent internet map of my home country. Mm -hmm. Like Google Maps displayed two roads, like one that goes across the country and one around the capital Minsk, and that was it. Yeah. And that was with all the competition. And at the same time, OpenStreetMap had really beautiful data for my home country. Uh, so that, that was one thing, uh, like, I, I was looking at the OpenStreetMap community and I saw that the, the project is, like, you know, really, really growing very well, but there was no good app to, to use it. So it was just, like, you know, data as an XML file, like, as a database, but no really smooth app to use it. Uh, that's one thing, and another point we decided to focus on was offline use which means like use without internet connection. And I, I mean, for maps, it, it really makes sense. Like 
when, when would you use a map? You probably wouldn't use it when, when you're at home, right? You probably use it when you're in some place you've never been before. And in that place, it might be you know, far away and you face home in charges or something happens and you're out of internet connection. So for maps, making it offline it actually makes perfect sense. And uh, there was no good offline map as well. So that was basically two ideas. So, but what was your initial uh, target? So I would say, maybe you say, okay, I want to create this app to, to, for 1,000 people, for 4,000 people, as I mentioned before. But could you imagine that uh, 40 million people would be using your app already at that time, or it was just something very small in the beginning? Well, when we started, when I started, it was you know, kind of my first business, so I didn't know how to you know, project the numbers forward. Yes. So we, we always made, like, we, we projected the numbers at most two years ahead. Yeah. Uh, but, like, if you think what, what apps are pre-installed on every phone, it's browse, browser, email, notes, uh, alarm clock, several others and maps are one of them okay. so with with the market now growing from two to three billion yeah. actually 40 million is still not not that much it's okay. you know about one percent of, of market okay so how did you get the motivation to start and found the, the company i understand that there was some market need or some personal need for a good application map but of course it's one thing is to have uh, you know, an idea and uh, develop an app, another idea is to, 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 to found a company. Uh, well, uh, I went once, uh, back, back then when I was working at Google, I went yeah. to Search Inside Yourself uh, workshop. It's kind of, you know, meditation, understanding what you really need in, in life, that kind of thing, workshop for two days, and I understood that, well, um, I am an engineer, I'm a good engineer, but it's it's not all that I'm passionate about. Yeah. I always wanted to start something myself. Mm -hmm. I still back then didn't know what, what to start, but I decided that uh, that was something I, I, I didn't devote much attention to that my passion. And yeah. that, that's how it started personally for me. Okay, when was the tipping point that you to decide that you were quitting your full-time job and you start your company? Um, well, basically, th that was like soon after that, that was tipping point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, which people were involved in founding the, the company? So, uh, I had accumulated some sum of money, but yeah. uh, uh, I didn't know how to proceed. So, I decided to to bring my friends to build the company, uh, and instead of basically paying them salary, uh, they all got a, a huge stock in the, in the company. So uh, I went back to my friends uh, from Belarus. Uh, one of them actually relocated to UK mm -hmm. and uh, talked them, to them about the idea. Uh, <coughs> they really loved the idea from the very beginning mm -hmm. and they became my co-founders and together built, built the company. Okay. How many people? So initially there were four people, mm -hmm. uh, like like really initially there were five people, but one guy after you know a week of work or two weeks of work he decided that he'll better spend several years in India, okay. and he, he went to India. So like for real there were four people. Mm -hmm. Later on, uh, one guy left left the company. Yeah. Uh, with basically a half of his stock option oh. that was reserved. Uh, like we had a vesting scheme, okay. uh, well, pretty, pretty classical, like when you don't know how much, like usually if, if you want to distribute stock between co-founders, it's about, it's, this stock is about future, not about the present moment. Yeah. So one thing like the way we did is that basically we have a huge <coughs> stock pool and then a small percent vests, you know, every month or every year for us was every month. Okay. Uh, and we projected that the whole pool will be vested in four years. Okay. So, 
at some time later one guy left and, yeah. and three co-founders became uh, are still active. Okay. <coughs> uh, that's that's an interesting point regarding the best thing. Maybe we'll uh, we'll come back later with that. So regarding the product development, <coughs> what was your approach to develop maps with me? So uh, initially, a friend of mine who became who became a mentor, he was he strongly insisted that uh, like after he, uh, after some time we, were, we still have you know very. A version we were very unhappy about, yeah. but it already worked, it already displayed the map. And uh, that guy, he insisted that we should launch it as a free app mm -hmm. immediately and then gather feedback. And uh, there was a lot of argument about that for a few weeks, but then we, we really launched it as a free version. And we got a lot of feedback. Uh, and basically the feedback was that the app was barely usable, but for people who really needed it, it was basically a lifesaver, uh, and well, it, it, it kind of like, for example, the map we made the map of US and it was two gigabytes. And if you want to use the app in the US, you have to download two gigabytes to oh, the data, yeah. of data to your phone. That was in the very first version, and of course, people hated that. But people who really need of, needed offline in the US, they before they did have, they had no option, and now they had an option. Yes. So. Uh, that, that put us kind of ahead of competition. <laughs> so we got a lot of uh, a, lo a lot of actually encouraging feedback, and together with encouraging feedback, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of feedback regarding where to improve the app. And since then, and up still actually up until now, we listen very much to the feedback that users provide, and yeah. we mostly develop features that users request. Okay, how, how do you do this kind of uh, Development. So, where do you get these people and ask for feedback? Of course, we, other, yeah. we read App Store reviews yeah. Yeah. And, and they write directly to us. Okay. We read emails. Okay, that's it. no secret. Okay, now, how much money did you spend for the first session or the free version that you went live? <coughs> you know, this well, is something very good for startup because sometimes they, they just go with a lot of money maybe and they want to build everything from scratch, maybe eight, nine months, and then after that they have no marketing, maybe. Let's say, we, we've never calculated that yeah. precisely. <laughs> so I had, I, I accumulated some money that kept my uh, life in Zurich. Yeah. The other guys accumulated some money to keep their life in Minsk uh, or traveling. Uh, so basically everyone accumulated money for themselves. Uh, we spent not much for the server, we had one server for several thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, then about 10,000 is a cost to create a company in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all about that. But actually we created a company uh, after we launched the paid version. Yeah. And after we launched the paid version, we started earning money without having a company. And we faced a problem that Apple somehow asks where where to send the money and we can't provide you know banking account where to send the money <laughs> so that was the point when we decided to create the company actually. <laughs> so and, and, and you know it, psychologically it's it's easier to create a company when you you, you know somebody wants to send you money but just don't don't have where to yeah that's so you you, you feel that you, you use the lean approach in this uh, this development or yeah, well, the approach we used later, we read about that in books that you know, it is called <laughs> approach. Okay. So let's move on, on more on idea validation. So which market uh, did you target in the beginning? For you, it was just a mass market, right? Well, when we targeted initially, we didn't think like, you know, in these categories, like, you know, we kind of didn't have these concepts yet in, in mind, so we, we kind of thought, well, maps is something that every traveler needs, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we, when we, we launched, we just started looking at actually who is using the app. Okay. So, okay, which feedbacks did you listen, and which, which one not? Because in the beginning, you, you also have many, many feedbacks, right? As, as you say, for the free version. But which one you say, oh, maybe we need to implement this or 
we are we also and how did you prioritize that? Well, when we were small, it was kind of easy. Now that we get like really tons of feedback, we just roughly count like there are no kind of dominant ideas okay. like when we before we when we didn't have uh, car navigation like you know everybody was writing about car navigation like every second letter was about that so it kind of was obvious and yeah. e even now it roughly follows Pareto rule so there, there are usually like one or two ideas that together occupy top maybe 60-80% of, of all the ideas of okay. all the feedback ideas so it, it's kind of quite easy okay so did you have an idea about the business model in the beginning or right now as well so how did you start and what's the business model in, right now in, in, you know we, uh, we started uh, like we wrote a business plan yeah. and uh, what's fascinating now is that like you know everything was realized as it was written in the business plan i couldn't believe that but that that's how it went so it's yeah. like not 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 all the parts are yeah. like fully realized yet but uh, like that business plan basically is the foundation of the strategy we as a male.lu group now have regarding the map strategy. Okay, when did you write then the business plan? After a few years or really just in the beginning? No, in the very beginning, like when we launched the first free version, we wrote a business plan to uh, to, to uh, attract some capital. Yeah. Okay. okay. How did, how did the feedback received help you change your initial idea? Well, the, the first thing we understood that 2 gigabytes for US was w way too much. Uh, and then, you know, kind, it's, it's kind of like when many people like look at the same thing, they, they notice something that, like after you read about that, it, it, it's obvious, like, a lot of uh, suggestions regarding mapping style, like mm -hmm. when something is not really very visible, and it, it's 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 kind of a difficult problem with maps. Like for example, why roads on most of the maps are either yellow, orange, or red? Mm -hmm. The reason is that if the road goes through the forest, you have to see it. And traditionally, forests are green, mm -hmm. and if the road goes through the sea. Uh, you want to see it, and seas are like all the water traditionally is blue, so it has to be some color that's very visible on top of green and on top of blue. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there are actually a lot of smaller cases that's uh, that becomes a nightmare when you try to design them. Yeah. Having all the feedback yes. is really useful. Like for example, one very difficult case. We, I, I don't really like how it's still solved in maps with me, but I, I don't see a better solution now is biking lanes or biking mm -hmm. roads. Yeah. It has to be visible again on top of uh, forest, but also on top of normal road and on top of you know, normal like cities. Okay. So are you planning to solve this problem with the bike? <laughs> well, uh, in the current style, they are like kind of red, maybe, yeah. maybe rose, uh, which attracts, I think, too much attention, but it, at least it's visible. So yeah. I, I, myself, I don't know a better solution right now. Okay. But for the last style, we hired one of the best mapping designers. That's uh, here, well, that, that, that's like, you know, design real map, mapping styles now. Okay, let's move on the position part, right? When you start with the, the company, they were, not many competitors, I would say, or there were some competitors. Google was one of them, I would say, and there was also other others. How did you position yourself? Well, we, we initially, you know, it's kind of like like European startup model, like when you try to focus on a very small group of yeah. customers uh, whom you deliver awesome experience and then yeah. you try kind of to expand this group. So uh, our main group were travelers who need to fly, like everyone who needs to fly. For them, we, we made the best possible. And from there, we, we tried to, to grow. Okay. And how did you uh, head to position with Mark with uh, compared to big jumps? I understand that you want, you know, try to, to, to restrict your group of users, but of course you also, uh, we're competing with uh, with Google's, right, or with other uh, big guys. 
I think we also have a question from the audience that yeah. fits into this. Yeah, well, we are still comp competing with Google, so there are like no several considerations regarding yeah. that. We now have one percent of market that Google has, yeah. and it, it it's kind of already enough for the company to exist. The second thing uh, we think that actually map is a very expensive thing to maintain, and if you look at other expensive things to maintain, like. For example, the, like when we started, there were four global companies who do maps. Yeah. Uh, like one of them was Google, one of them was OpenStreetMap, one of them, of them was Naptek, which almost got bankrupt yeah. and was sold to was sold was acquired by Nokia and was sold by Nokia uh, more than five billion dollars for more than five billion dollars less, and which accumulated several billion dollars of losses for Nokia yeah. uh, and. One of them was Teleatlas, which was acquired by TomTom, Tom, which is not doing, you know, very well. And that that kind of reminds the operating system market. Yeah. Like it's also very difficult to develop and maintain an operating system. And then uh, once that becomes an alternative that's free to use, the whole industry starts developing this alternative. Well, I mean Linux nowadays. So we, we think that yes, Google can you know spend billion dollar a year for the next 10, 20 years, uh, but for all the rest guys, it, it will anyway make sense to, to maintain one common source of knowledge, okay. of geographical knowledge. Okay. So in, in this case for you it was map, uh, street map, right? Open street yes, map. Open street map. Okay. What metrics did you track on a regular basis? Just the downloads of the app? Well, initially the downloads. Uh, initial when we made the paid version, we started tracking money, yeah. of course. When we started heavy marketing, we started tracking money after marketing, revenue after marketing. And the idea is that if you, if you buy advertisement, you want that advertisement to be performant. And if you can measure the performance and make such that uh, every dollar you spend produces you more than a dollar then at, at that point you can actually invest a real lot in marketing. And then the metric you track is no longer revenue, but the revenue of after marketing. Uh, we track heavily retention. Mm -hmm. uh, and But this is not kind of the daily metric you track. The daily metric we track uh, average reviews. reviews. And uh, not as a daily metric, but something we think is important and uh, kind of pain point for maps.me is it shown on the first session, which means how many users after first opening the app return to the app and how many, what percentage of users after like first launching the app leaves the application. So, did you find that the app uh, is not a success or what did you do about that? So when you had some kind of problem or increase in these metrics, right? Did you? How did you solve that? Uh, or mention some 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 problem that you had during it? You know, it's, it's difficult. Like for example, we have uh, the problem with Chorn that uh, it was like it was more than fifty percent of users leave the app after first opening it, yeah. uh, which was kind of pain. Uh, and we made download maps smaller and we separated like map, maps of the whole country into smaller maps so that it would be, be, it would be a smooth experience for the first time users. We made uh, you know, a small tutorial about how, like, to use, how to use the app. Uh, I wouldn't say it helped, like, you know, it solved the problem. No, it didn't solve the problem, but it helped. It helped a lot. Uh, yeah, that, I think okay. that's about it. Okay, how did you manage the, the grow initially? Of course, I mean, you had this app, you just put on an episode and you get 1,000 downloads, 10,000 downloads, but from there you also need to kind of advertising and improve the, the, the app, right? How did you manage this part of the group? From zero to 10,000 and then from 3,000 to some millions? Well, zero to 10,000, it was like, you know, very quick, probably yeah. several weeks. So, uh, 
I don't know. I mean, the app works uh, on mobile phones. It doesn't require much of the servers. So there is basically nothing to manage. Initially, like the the the, the number of emails is growing, yeah. and but initially we answered all the emails ourselves. Later on, we hired. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still not more than two people answering all the emails. So yeah. it, it, it's it's not that much. Uh, so I think th that was something that we thought about initially. Is that uh, well, for example, for Google, the computing paradigm is that there are data servers somewhere, data centers, yeah. and all the computation is there. And an app is kind of thin client that connects to a data center. And we did quite the opposite model. Like all the heavy work is done on mobile phone, and and that way it's very cheap to scale. Yeah. Like, and uh, it makes the scaling cheap and al almost infinite. Okay. okay, we have some questions from the audience. Okay, did you not worry about Google Maps introducing an offline map? Yeah, that's maybe we, you already covered <coughs> this part. Or <coughs> you want to add something there? So, uh, guiding the investors, we don't have, we almost don't have. Like once we had, uh, uh, once we needed uh, urgently 10k dollars, and uh, actually a, a friend of mine just, you know, I, I wouldn't call him an investor, but yeah. but he got like informally he got some stock yeah. that was written on me, and then. He, once we sold maps, he, 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 he got uh, a good return on his investment, but he wasn't really an, an investor. So, uh, uh, regarding us, well, so far we see that the, the way it goes, uh, uh, that the Google also does a, a good thing explaining to you know, ordinary people what so funny is, why, why maps do not work without internet, that kind of stuff. And we think we still, like for offline case, we still work better than Google. But what's more important uh, is that now OpenStreetMap in many developing countries work much better than Google does. So there are many areas where OpenStreetMap is just, you know, the only source of map information. And which country? Like uh, for us, Philippines now is the number one country by the number of users. Yeah. And I've never been, it's a shame I've never been to Philippines, but uh, we know that there is a very good open street map data there. Okay. So and that, that might be the reason. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, in many actually developed European countries, yeah. open street map has a lot to provide that Google Maps do not have. So I think that uh, there is a competition kind of between Google Maps offline and our offline, but I think it's shifting more <coughs> to competition between OpenStreetMap and Google Maps. Yeah. So when you sold the app, did you think of leaving the company? Uh, no. <laughs> no, well, it, it's yes and no. So the, the thing, uh, it, it was still three of, three of us, uh, Founders who own the company and who own the map, and we we kind of started analyzing that our personal interests they diverge. One guy wanted to go traveling around the world. One guy wanted to go, you know, in the real economy kind of thing, like to, to build his own a small plant, plant and. Um, and one, one guy, myself, I want, wanted them to, to be developed further. Yeah. And that, that was one thing. Another thing we saw that the paid application model, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work very well. And we believe that for apps, subscription model is like, doesn't work very well either. So we believe that it all will go to the advertisement. Okay. And for that, we, we needed to kind of make, make a change and uh, uh, instead of you know relying on our, on the revenue that we receive, start relying on the advertisement mm -hmm. revenue. And also, what was very important for us, uh, we decided that we want really to build an app for OpenStreetMap. And the problem was that uh, making uh, an app 
paid application, we kind of couldn't attract as many users, especially from developing countries, as we wanted to. So we started looking for investment, or another potential was buyout. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Mail.eu, we, we saw that uh, they kind of see the strategy as, as we see it. So in, initially, it was about that we will stay for some time within Mail.eu to, you know, to, to kind of achieve what we, what we actually wanted to achieve. So yes, we were thinking uh, about leaving, but we kind of more thinking that for the next more than a year we will stay and make, make uh, you know kind of get the app to to the level where we want it to be. To be yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's move on the marketing part. What was your marketing strategy? So uh, <laughs> I basically. Uh, uh, so the, the the way marketing works, uh, or like, could you please raise the hands who heard about performance marketing? And what what does it mean? Some people. So uh, the way like we we heavily use performance marketing. Uh, what what it means is that for for every dollar we spend, we try to calculate what what the return is. And uh, let's first go back uh, to when we had a paid application because there the marketing was very simple because when somebody buys an application, we know uh, how much money we earn. And then it means that up to that amount of money we can spend for advertisement yeah. if you cannot pair per, per installation, per purchase. Which leads us to unit economy which means we can calculate all the economy divided by the number of units in production or the number of app installations. And, and, and there, like, uh, ba basically, if, if, you can, like, if you have a free app or if, and you have a subscription model or you have um, a free app and advertisement model, you can calculate how much you earn roughly on uh, ah, yeah, I put something that you mentioned. Oops, thanks. You, you can calculate roughly uh, what you will add. So, for example, let's assume we, we assume that we will make, we will display advertisement. Or in general, we want, we have free app, but we want as much user attention globally uh, as needed. Then we can basically factor that, that like, Let's say if we have total time spent on the app and we display ads somewhere in the app somehow, uh, then the, the, the amount of revenue we get from advertisement will be proportional to the total time that's spent in the app. And the total time that's spent in the app, we factor it is number of installations, how many installations were there, uh, or retention, like in some period of time, what's the percent of users that uh, stayed with the app and kept keep using it. Uh, then what was the number of average session, let's say, per day? And then was the length of the session. And then if you multiply this all, you'll get the total time spent in the app. And if if you sell uh, advertisement within the app, or if you like, you know, some larger guys like mail.ru, like Facebook, like Google, you want as many people attention to your app as possible, even if you don't sell advertisement. So that's kind of the, the ultimate goal, the ultimate metric you, you want to increase. And uh, so it, it works a bit differently with the paid, paid application. It's, it's very similar also with subscription models. Uh, we, I can go into that details later. Okay. So, and because this is a product of four numbers, if you double any of the numbers, then uh, you, you double the result, obviously, right? So it actually doesn't matter uh, which, which number you're going to double. So, uh, like, installs, either way, like, of, of course we do PR, of course we write to the bloggers, of course we write to the travel bloggers, of course we write to the 
uh, uh, bloggers that do app reviews. Uh, and, and that's, that's all, it's, it's relatively cheap. Uh, that's all is a basically a fixed amount of money that you spend every month. And that's mostly something that you pay to PR agency or to your PR person. Uh, sometimes some blogger ask a little bit of money for the reviews, but it's not much, but it, it has a very limited impact. It helps you to get from you know, zero to 100,000, 100, maybe from zero to a million, but probably not more. We don't have viral, like real, you know, viral mechanics also, but we know that travelers recommend the app to other travelers. That's something that we know. So, and basically the rest uh, is advertisement that you buy. And then the more, the more money you spend here, the more, like, you know, the, the more you'll get. Uh, but let's examine the, the other multipliers. So retention. You can factor retention as uh, the number of people who returned after the first session and then from that point of time the number of people that keep returning to the app or return to the app on the third month or after a year or after a week. And for us, for example, we, had, we have uh, quite some optimal churn. So like people either love the app or hate the app because about the half of the people used to, now it's a bit less, but still it's quite high uh, number of people that leave after the first session, but the ones who stay, they stay, they stay for long. And by improving the product, uh, you can improve the retention. And, the, and, and that's basically much cheaper than investing a lot of money in advertisement, obviously. That's why uh, there is a common strategy to build a product, launch it on a small test market or test it with the friends or test it you know just with PR see what is retention and if retention is good then start investing in, into like performance marketing by installations then the number of sessions is how often you use the app and that's the reason all the apps now send you push notifications and try to you know send you news and lots of stuff like that and uh, length, of, length of session is the amount of time that the person spends within the app. So for example, if you, if you take Facebook, they have installations of, they, like almost everybody installed Facebook. Uh, they have pretty good retention. Yep. Uh, one, and, and then basically they have two options how to increase the total amount of time humanity spends in Facebook. It's by sending you more and more push notifications, and that's the reason why they send a lot of push notifications that are, I, I would say, quite irrelevant, at least in my Facebook. That's the way. And that's, that's the reason why they try to optimize the content to, to actually to make you spend more and more and more time in, in Facebook, because that basically these two are the only growth points for, for Facebook app itself. Yeah, so, uh, and well, ba ba basically the idea is how to get to 25 million or whatever number of million, you, you make an economy work, unit economy work. Like, you, you, you make such that one installation uh, should bring you on average more than you spend on the installation. And then, uh, up, until, up until this is the case, you invest more and more and more and more. Uh, into buying adver advertisement. And the guys like Facebook, for example, they actually give you credit, almost unlimited credit, as long as they see that you're actually earning money with the advertisement, uh, they themselves give you credit, uh, so you buy more and more ads. How much money did you spend monthly on, on uh, uh, Facebook for your sales? So, uh, before we sold the company, yeah. Uh, before we sold the app, we actually kind of sold the company. Before we sold the app, uh, we spent it slightly more than hundred thousand yeah. dollars per month on Facebook. Okay, let's start with a question from uh, from the audience. Yeah, did you just use Facebook, or what yeah. did you use for making advertising? 
So it, it's kind of, for me it feels that Facebook is kind of three years ahead of the competition. We tried to use whatever makes sense, but uh, because from the technology point of view, the advertisement technology of Facebook, it works so much better than anywhere else, or at least we managed to make it work so much better than anywhere else, we mostly used Facebook. So the, the reason is that Facebook shows you real-time performance uh, of your marketing campaigns. And the marketing guys, they create a lot of campaigns, and campaign means what message do I say, send to the users with what banner? And that also works different for people of different ages, for people of different sex, and for people in different countries. Like in some countries, maps.me is really popular for the drivers, and then the image is the, okay, can you see driving wheel, and then, an app over there, and in some countries uh, for the travelers. And so the marketing guys, they try a lot of a lot of campaigns, like we have, uh, we used to have, and we still have, like, you know, we used to have hundreds of campaigns running, now we have probably around thousands of campaigns running, and they try to quickly switch all the campaigns that don't work, and quickly get give more budget to the campaigns that do work. So this whole technology, it kind of, it now works better for competitors, but uh, several years ago it, it worked much better on Facebook. Now the competition is getting there. So that was the reason with Facebook. We tried a lot with Google, but uh, because, the, uh, because Google knows the context of your search, <laughs> there, are, there were not so many offline map searches on Google, and we kind of tried to buy that, but that kind of a small amount comparing to the uh, ads that we can buy on Facebook. Then there, there is uh, mail.ru's uh, VK network, it's, it's very popular in Russia and in general in Russian speaking countries. They kind of lag behind Facebook in the technology but uh, they actively copying it. So we, we used to work and we continue to work with them, which basically works the same. And uh, yeah, well, we, we, we try to find other channels, but that, like, I, I would recommend if you're starting something new, if you are like starting something small, then Facebook is a very easy choice and uh, it, it works well. So now we try to find large publishers beyond Facebook and we, we do use them, but that's more work and that makes sense only when you saturate it with other channels. What's your experience with YouTube? With YouTube, uh, we couldn't make the like we couldn't make large volume that that will work uh, for us. From what I talked to other marketing guys, uh, it looks like YouTube as TV it works well for brand recognition, mm -hmm. but that's very difficult to measure. And because we were very lean, we don't have money to spend on such, you know non-scientific things like brand recognition that you can't really measure. We were like a lot about performance marketing and still is. Mm -hmm. So for us, YouTube didn't work well. And how important do you think is the external keyword optimization, especially specifically for the, say, the organic traffic that you get? Is the organic traffic an important part? Yes, yes, yes. Part? yes. It, 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 it's absolutely a very important part. Um, so, it depends on how much we invest into marketing now, but it's, it's uh, still about, well, depending on how much we invest, it's still about one third and half of all the traffic, which is quite a lot. If I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken, but it's still pretty sizable. So it's, not, it's probably not less than one third of all the traffic we get from organics. And yeah, well, and it, it also depends uh, how much you invest. So before we invested less in, into the advertisement, but, but still quite a lot. And our target was initially to have uh, two installs organic for one pay, then to have about 50-50. And App Store optimization helps a lot. So, uh, you, you know, bef before there were a lot of uh, talks uh, uh, how to get into the top applications, we think it 
kind of took overall for the country, it kind of helps, but not, not that really much. But what really helps is that when somebody writes keywords that, that you have, your app appears in the search keywords. And I think that because the, the market changed, like uh, three and five years ago, the people who had iPhones were innovators that wanted to try something new, and they kind of explored what are the apps over there, and now as it becomes mass market, people are searching, like more searching on the app store. So we see that uh, keyword optimization becomes, you know, very extremely important for the organic traffic and extremely important uh, altogether. And it's it's relatively cheap because even if you hire, you know, top uh, app store optimizer, it's still some fixed amount of money you pay and then you get uh, the results for maybe months or even years afterwards. And one of the like, you know, classical secrets in App Store optimization is that the very important keywords you should put into the name of the app. That's why the app is called maps.me dash offline maps. <coughs> So, from what I've heard tonight, your story really was a straight line success. No, I don't were, were there any times when you had, when you made a mistake that you might save someone else to find some lucky in your position? It, 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 it was a straight line success. For a long time, we couldn't earn money. We, we see that we, we get downloads. We couldn't uh, attract capital because investors saw that, hey, this guy's going to compete with Google. No, no, no. And uh, at some point, we burned all the cash uh, I accumulated, all the cash the guys accumulated. I sold my apartment in Minsk. And uh, I actually had to fire the, the most expensive guy in the company, which was me. And <laughs> <laughs> I was still, you know, involved moonlight time in that. And I went to go for, to work for eBay. Uh, and another micro founder started uh, running the company and when the things went better he asked me to, to return uh, and I had to think a lot like wh wh why why wasn't we, we doing really like wh why wasn't we really doing good in terms of money at the beginning and what, what to do next and what were the mistakes and how to solve them and well, the key takeaways for me personally were that I should get further from my comfort zone and I should find somebody, a mentor, uh, who has like, who has really, really great success in the app business and who, whom I can consult uh, often. And I, I was very lucky that uh, I found a guy who was a CEO of another app who, was, who had back then 30 million downloads and I managed to attract him and he became a shareholder and further on uh, his employer didn't like that he, he, spent, he started spending more and more and more time with maps.me and uh, his main employer didn't like that and it didn't went very well so he's now working full time for maps.me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We like we didn't have subscription model. We were thinking about uh, whether we sh whether we should tran transfer from the paid model to the subscription model, uh, and the conclusion we came to was that uh, we see that subscription model is not working as as good as as we expect that advertisement will work. So we decided directly we we should go to the advertisement. And for maps, particularly for maps, uh, there are a lot of uh, intents of the user that you can monetize. Like if somebody is looking for a hotel, you can just suggest to book that hotel. And it doesn't look like it, it is advertisement, but it doesn't look to the user as advertisement. It looks like a value added service. Or if somebody going from A to B, we're now offering uh, walking directions, we now offering uh, car navigation, we could offer a taxi. Maybe if it's like a huge distance, <coughs> you can show plane tickets. 
we were thinking about these models and, and, and they kind of integrate seamlessly in, in, in there. Yeah. How do you get your advertising? Is it through that one agency organizes all of the advertising for you or do you do different markets separately? No, I strongly believe that uh, you shouldn't outsource the core of your business and marketing is definitely absolutely the core of the business. Uh, it, and to uh, advertise efficiently, you have to really understand what, what your users care about and what your non-yet users care about. So we, we did it as a matter of principle, we did it always ourselves to to accumulate knowledge inside the company. And n now at mail.ru, uh, mail.ru has an advertisement department and they can buy ads cheaper because, because of the volume, because they're doing advertisement for other mail.ru properties and we're, we're very tiny in comparison you know, to the guys with 100 million active users, yeah. that, that kind of thing. No, well, I'm talking about the advertising that <coughs> bonds you, so the people who advertise on your how do you get those people? Like, ah, like uh, who advertise on our app? Yeah. We don't yet. Oh. We're going to integrate booking.com, perhaps Airbnb, so, and other uh, aggregators. So we're just going to come to guys who already aggregated mm. advertisers. Okay, and do you approach those companies directly or is there an agency who handles those? Uh, companies like Booking.com are very easy to approach, and they also have um, <coughs> like kind of public offering, so you can click a few buttons, click link, put, put a tick mark, I agree, and that means that you kind of sign a contract and you get access to, to the advertisement for free over the internet. You actually don't need to talk to anyone. <laughs> and, and then even if you do, like, on the maps market, we're quite visible, so for us it's super easy to, to talk to any of the you know, geo guys. If you want... Sorry, can you maybe expand a little bit more about this, because you, you, your unfair advantage was to be offline and, and you know, you're transferring some of the revenue you make towards advertising in the future, as you mentioned. Uh, how does this you know, offline and online combination work for you? Well, we see now that 80% of sessions are online. It's more, you know, kind of selling security. That once, once you get to the place where you're flying, you can still use the app. But most of the people use the app online. And e even if you want to kind of book a hotel, it's not a big deal to, to go and find internet because you will need it anyway. If you would do it all again, what would you do different? Well, I'm afraid it wouldn't be possible again because kind of when we started, uh, the market wa wasn't saturated and it was growing a lot. And it turned out to be the market of billions of people. So, uh, uh, I, I don't think like kind of that repeating that would would make uh, would make any sense? Then, if I will do it a again with with the knowledge I accumulated by making mistakes, uh, I would you know uh, I would try first to test the app that it, it really works, and then invest a lot into marketing because I think we started marketing way too late, mm -hmm. and we started tracking the user metrics way too late. Uh, It's, open, it's, a, it's an open source project, no? Do you give something back as well <coughs> well, to the, to the project? First, Maps.me is also now an open source project. Uh, so the code is available under Apache license, which is very non-restrictive. We are also a founding, uh, a corporate, not founding, corporate member of OpenStreetMap, which it doesn't cost very much, but there are not so many companies that are uh, investing an order of thousands of dollars into OpenStreetMap. Then, in the recent version, we launched an OpenStreetMap editor within the app, so that our users can edit the map, and we send edits to the OpenStreetMap. And 
when we did that, uh, we set uh, a record of the number of weekly OpenStreetMap editors. And we plan to uh, attract more and more, to involve more and more our users into actually editing OpenStreetMap from within Maps. You told that you want to retain in the company until you sold it. How does it feel? Do you still like feel that it's your company or you feel like being a part of a large corporate business which is uh, going in the direction which you cannot really steer? Well, for mail.ru it's kind of uh, it's kind of an interesting story because it's it for, for public it's kind of like one company but internally it's more like a federation with uh, with quite independent business units and the the CEO of the company doesn't like it is the strategy to not to be involved into you know disputes between the units and some of the units compete with each other so it, it still all feels uh, very much like the company is small because you know we, we sit all together we we, we we are very much independent. Mm -hmm. So no, no regrets so far that it was a needed solution or you would have um, found a, like I don't know venture investor who would uh, be not that involved into. Well. Um, by speaking to many venture investors, I think that um, the guys who run, like you know, really large businesses are, are often smarter mm -hmm. and uh, are often able to give a better advice because, like in, you know, if you see in very high detail, like several hundred million user businesses, you you, you can infer more knowledge and then share with, with this, okay. this knowledge. For us, uh, for the founders, we like my co-founders wanted to exit, and we made a cash out for them. Mm -hmm. That was like you know re re really something. Like I, I, as a CEO, I didn't as a CEO of Maps with me in I didn't want my shareholders to kind of regret that they started all of this. And now they don't. We made the app completely free, and we made the app open source, and we made the OpenStreetMap editor. And all of that was wouldn't be you know it would be very hard to explain to kind of you know, you know investors at least the investors I talked to were more focused on a shorter term and the male little guys were kind of focused more on, on a longer gameplay for male daughter kind of uh, uh, an idea to to become like a, a long time player, like there are not so many mapping companies out there, right? And mm -hmm. for them, it's more long term business. So, like, you, you know, accumulating all these points, yes, I'm, I'm happy. But do that. you also feel that um, your, uh, it's beneficial for you not only in terms of uh, their money, but also in terms of, um, I don't know, knowledge or network sharing? Yes, probably. Yeah. Uh, definitely in terms of knowledge. Absolutely, because uh, I get a lot of advice. Uh, we are able now to attract, you know, a lot more talent in the company. And overall, I think, like in the last year, we made more than in four years before or five years before. So I think it it, it all accelerated. And with regard to my personal experience, in the last year, I got more experience than I got in the four years before. How, how um, many months went by from the moment you left Google to the moment you search a job at eBay? Uh, might be mistaken, but I think it's about two years. Okay. So by that time, you're basically depleted because you bootstrapped. You basically depleted your savings. Yes. And would you care to say what percentage of your savings went down for the next for the first two years? What do you mean? What percentage went down? What percentage of your saving was down for those two years? Did you burn ninety percent of your savings? Did you burn hundred percent? I burned hundred percent. Just say it's very. It's I mean, very you just mentioned that he sold his apartment uh, in Belarus, so it means actually yes, yeah. So and I burned all the money I accumulated, but I mean, uh, as one of my mentors says that, like one of my personal problems is that. Uh, 
I have like I have a very high he says flaw to fall because at the very worst case, like at the very worst case, what can happen to me? I'll go to work for Google, eBay, Facebook, you, you know what I mean. So it's a very safe position to kind of burn all the cash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because you know, wouldn't you have thought that you could still have employed a co-founder to get started for the first few months while still working at Google? And then jump the ship as soon as you saw that there was enough feedback from the, um, from the users? Well, first, uh, it's not allowed by the Google policy, by the Google contract. Uh, so, like, th this was already impossible. And I actually, specifically, I asked Google if it, if it is possible, and the answer was no. I didn't know yet that it will be maps. Uh, it just, in general, was no to any app developer. And that, that was one no. And another no was that I think, well, for, for me, it's very difficult to multitask. So I have, like, you know, really get my attention to one single thing. One question has nothing to do with that, if I may. It's about, you haven't mentioned about Google um, AdWords and Google in general um, marketing uh, softwares. You favor Facebook. Would you care to expand on why Google wasn't useful in your case? Because, so, uh, let's, let's imagine an ace. Uh, from like from least performant advertisements to the most performant, and the least performant is like TV ads. Then goes YouTube kind of thing, right? And then uh, the AdWords, it's kind of super performant because it knows what you're searching for, and then uh, by that it, it can allow uh, like it, it shows very very relevant ads, and not so many people are searching for offline maps. So if we advertise for offline map or map searches, we don't get enough volume. So we do get some volume. It does make sense, but it is tight. So to get full volume, we have to move into kind of less, less performance-based advertisement where we can get more volume, but still target that very high enough. Or like you, you can think about that from another perspective. The problem is that the competition on Google AdWords is really, really, really huge. Like, really huge. Like, if you think about hotels, uh, they spent, uh, for example, in Moscow, in Google, for Google's competitor, Yandex, they spent, hotel in Moscow spends $10 per click on their advertisement. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, there, are, there was at least a cap on Google advertisement for hundred dollars per click, and there were com and, and there was a problem because for some keywords companies were uh, bidding maximum, and it was hard, hard to choose between the companies when they all built hundred dollars per click. So w w with this kind of competition, it's extremely difficult to advertise. Mm -hmm. And back then, Facebook only launched the advertisement, and it kind of was quite an empty space you like whenever you know whenever somebody launches a new advertisement uh, format or a, a new advert a new place of advertisement <coughs> big guys like coca-cola they they're quite slow to turn their attention they plan their budgets like probably a year ahead so 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 and it all goes to agencies so so all these larger guys who buy a lot of advertisement they're very slow and back then the Facebook was quite empty. And now Facebook launched uh, audience network, basically the advertisement for third parties. So it's still not, not so full. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you would like, that that would be probably good to invest in marketing, in marketing faster. What do you think would be an implications? Uh, do you think you could possibly reach the stage where you are now faster or yes yes absolutely and uh, and we would have reached much higher numbers now mm -hmm. the problem was that at, at the point where the product was already great mm -hmm. uh, we haven't invested much into marketing and uh, 
that was something that the, the guy, uh, the CEO guy whom I talked about, became a mentor. That's the experience he brought. And actually, from his perspective, he, he is really good in marketing and he saw that the app is doing really amazing, but uh, it's not doing great in marketing. So he thought that by investing his uh, experience, uh, it, it can build a lot of effort. Do you think it was like lack of your skills or experience in marketing which was missing this kind of ingredient which this guy brought? Or yeah, I think that was experience in marketing. Yeah. So you said you didn't get a lot of, of searches from people looking for offline maps. How did you get from zero to thousand or ten thousand first? How did you find the first test users? Well, uh, we just launched an app on the App Store. I said that not many people are searching for an app on Google. Uh, I think it's more typical if you're searching for an app to open an App Store and search in the App Store. And that's kind of a completely different story. So you basically were just, you had the luck that everybody was looking for maps at that time, right? At that time, uh, at that time, uh, Apple featured all the new apps. It wasn't so many new apps. So like once you launch a new release, for several hours you are featured on the screen that's uh, accessible with one tap, like the, the, the newest apps. And it, get, it got a lot of traffic and then uh, once you get there, you, you can jump in the ratings. But now I would just write bloggers who are like, like if I'm starting, like if I was starting maps now, I would have written uh, app review sites and I would have written bloggers. And you need, like with many, many of them, you, you can do this all for free. Many bloggers write only for free. And you can just write, say, hey, you know, you're writing about traveling. Uh, why wouldn't you review the different offline maps? Here, here is our app, this is our competitors. Here is a coupon code to try our paid version for free, and many bloggers write that. And it brings, it brings very high quality users, it brings users who are very motivated in, in the app. And you can see how app performs with very motivated users, because once you start growing, the users, like the users you attract, the most motivated you already, you, you have already attracted the most motivated, and they, then you attract kind of more casual users, more and more casual users. So you, you found a, a great successful company. Could you imagine going back to, for example, Google or Facebook after this experience, or you you stay you will stay for the next time and start? Up? Well, I, I would say it depends on what what to do. Mm -hmm. So if it's something like you know I really feel deeply involved in and deeply passionate about, why not? Since the app is now for free, where's the money coming in? Well, uh, that, that was the idea that money are not coming in now, but we are soon launching the advertisement. What do you track for the advertisement? Because it's an offline map, do you track offline usage as well? Or? Because so advertisement, I guess, in general, want to know everything you do. Well, we, uh, yes, we, we, we try to track as much information as possible. Uh, we are open source, so anyone can see what we are talking about. Uh, there is a switch to, to, to uh, cancel all the tracking, and it really cancels all the, all the tracking. Uh, we try to, to gather a lot of information because we believe we can build later on on that information. Like, for example, if we know your position and your altitude, we can build a much better altitude map of the world. Like at least when you go hiking, we, we can build a more precise map of altitude for hiking. As one example. So we track if the user is online and offline. Most of the users are, are actually online. And by saying advertisement, I don't really mean you know kind of a nasty banner like you know on top of your map, but, but more like if you're looking for a business, uh, more options to to acquire services from that business from within the map. 
So what's the future? Like what's the next big thing that you're planning from a product perspective? You already talked about advertising, but that's more on the financial part. Uh, from a product perspective. That's OpenStreetMap Editor. Mm -hmm. it, it was where, like, you know, it, it was launched with kind of embarrassing version. Uh, we wanted, you know, launch it as it is. It's, it's a nightmare to register. We wanted to make it much better. You can edit only a small percentage of uh, objects, like mostly you can add point objects and edit point objects. And there are so many more things to edit. We want to make viral mechanics show you how, like, who are the most active OpenStreetMap contributors in your area, how you compare getting them, like a, a lot of things about editing OpenStreetMap. And, and we are happy to get to the point where most of our, of our users complain about OpenStreetMap quality, not the application quality, but about the data quality. And we, we see that uh, we are now in the position to help OpenStreetMap become much better, and probably it's only us in that position. So if we don't do this, nobody will do this. So this is our main strategic goal for the next year or two. Any intention to implement something like Wise? Did, like uh, socializing, to say the uh, movement experience. Uh. Uh, we want first to try socialize editing. Like uh, we don't, we don't like we were thinking about that for five years already. We don't really see uh, a very valid intent to socialize, and we hope that if like if you edit something, you basically help in many people, not only maps.me users, but all the OpenStreetMap users. So we, we, we try we'll try to make part of the socializing regarding that thing uh, first. I don't know how much it's socializing, how much it will be kind of viral mechanics, but it is to share the places you edited and make such that if people click the link you shared, they immediately get that place into their maps along these things so and with the rest we were thinking a lot about that but we couldn't come with an idea that you know we, we believe will work well for the maps um, now you mentioned that now philippines is one of your largest market back at that point do you, do you actually plan to go into philippines and how do you know that you are ready to go in to, to somewhere outside of we decided we initially built the global application. You, you know, in Belarus it's very easy. The, there is zero market internal. It's like with Israel, like Israeli companies also, they never build for, for the internal market because it just don't work. You, you can't pay your salaries, right? Like in Belarus there are maybe two internet companies who can pay their salaries and that's it. They don't even pay, you know, dividends, right? That, that basically is. So, like if you, if, uh, and, and, and it was in general deeply, you know, our belief that we, we should go global from this from the beginning, and we wrote the application initially such that uh, it would be very easy to localize, and for example, we wrote search such that it works in different languages from the beginning from, from the scratch, and then we saw that localization actually helps to attract users much better. It, it really helps a lot localization. So we're now localized, like last time I checked, we were localized in 22 languages. <coughs> and uh, yeah, we're slowly getting to, to the stage where we might localize to the <laughs> 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 Yes, please. You mentioned at the beginning you were working for, probably still working in different places. Like yeah. Like over here, somebody was in London, somebody in Belarus. The guy from London relocated back to Minsk, so most of the team was in Minsk. Okay. Uh, but the headquarters uh, was in Zurich and like kind of all the deals were signed from Zurich, all the marketing what was done in Zurich, all the IP was in Zurich. Just because you live here or any other reason? It's kind of not like, there, there are several reasons. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's kind, kind of when, when you like doing marketing, you have to pay to a lot of offshore companies. All these, you know, advertisement companies there on Cayman Islands, on BVIs. 
and in turn you have to be paid by Google and Apple and uh, when you're doing business with companies like Facebook they kind of want want you to be like like you know re re something real not, not, not kind of a scam guy so it's much more difficult uh, to make these international connections from Belarus and this especially to pay uh, to offshore companies, to companies like Ukraine. I was not even thinking about Belarus. I'm, I'm from Ukraine, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe uh, other places like I don't know, uh, US or Berlin, like Germany, for example, which is uh, also very famous for startups and the, so on. I would say the problem, <laughs> like the company, is headquartered in my apartment. Okay. And <laughs> my wife runs the company, and uh, and initially we didn't know that it like how, how far it will get so for, for us it was like you know, it was an obvious choice and we knew that with regard to tax and to regulations and all this kind of you know nasty stuff when, when you begin a company Switzerland is a very, very nice place that, uh, okay. to, to make business that's a completely opposite opinion which I heard before sorry? it's a completely opposite opinion from what I heard before because uh, I heard that you have to pay taxes in advance you have to it's too expensive for, okay, as, for investors to become investors. As a company, you don't have paid taxes in advance. For an investment, it is a bit of a problem because they like British law, and mm -hmm. it's not British law. Uh, so far, the taxes authorities, they are like very, very reasonable. The banks are very, very reasonable. So, for example, uh, the guy who was uh, my mentor who came from, uh, from a different path, they had problems that their banks, bank accounts were blocked in the US because they were paying to offshore companies for, for advertisement. That was like completely for valid reasons. Uh, so, y you know, when you're doing international business, there are lots of cases like this and having a brand of Swiss company, like, like Switzerland is the place probably everywhere in the world people are happy to deal with. And uh, the banking system is very flexible, mm -hmm. so it, I, I should say it all worked very well. Yes. One question: You were split quite at the beginning, right? You were in Zurich, and the other guys were in Minsk. And um, how did you do it with the functions? Did you really like give clear functions, or did you do like stuff which came up in Zurich and they did in Minsk, and you communicated across? Or how did it was you like more? Well, I was fine to Minsk, then they lived for some time. In <laughs> then you know we have a tradition every year we, we went to some place to work for the whole team for, for several weeks and it, it was very flexible okay. yeah, but the functions they were uh, clearly assigned or did you like still communicate with each other every day about when? we obviously communicated with each other every day differently and the functions were not clearly assigned they like you know very very far from being clearly assigned I mean, we were software engineers. We've never built the companies before. We didn't know really how to do this. We, we know how to write apps, right? And then, like, our approach to build the business, well, let's write an app and see what's what's going on. <laughs> we need money, let, let's make it a paid app. And then, oops, we have cash accumulated, and Apple pings us, hey, guys, you don't have a bank account. Where should we send the money to? And then, let, let's build the company. That was our approach. The software engineer way. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I have one more. Yeah. Um, so let's say today, if you're by yourself, you have an idea. How would you plan your next six months going to be? Or like in terms of building the new team and and getting funding and all this. How how would you do it in the environment today? How how would it? If you, let's say you have an idea today. Uh, well, uh, if it's also very, if it is very much engineering connected, uh, I think it's quite difficult actually to, to build an engineering company in Switzerland because, uh, and it's not the first reason because of the salaries being high. I, I would say the first reason is that there is a lot of competition for the talent. A lot of like you know world top companies are here. Competing and ETH is not producing actually enough as I, as I think ETH is not producing enough software engineers for Switzerland. So there is like huge, huge competition here. 
Uh, and like, you, you know, I don't have personal connections that much developed here, and I have a lot uh, really good personal connections developed in, in Belarus, in the software engineering community. So that, there I, I could probably approach like the best uh, sport programmers, for example, as an example. On the other hand, I, I really like the idea of, uh, you know, kind of marketing guys, uh, business development guys, being uh, in some different place where it's very easy to, to approach people from different cultures, people from different uh, countries. And the third thing is that we, we didn't think actually about structuring the company. And actually most of the companies, there's structured such that the IP is being somewhere in the IP box, like in, in, in some special licensing scheme where it's uh, cheap to like, you know, later sell IP or sell the company, that kind of stuff. For Switzerland, there is that scheme in Canton Niedwalden, uh, and well, Luxembourg, uh, Cyprus, British Virgin Islands, uh, uh, Netherlands are quite famous to have the, this kind of schemes than having an operation company in in some country where it's easy to, to do business development worldwide and Switzerland is one of the nice places and then having development somewhere where you can actually compete for the development development talent for the engineering talent and so I, I would have built probably something like uh, development office in Belarus or, or in Russia or in Ukraine where like you know the, the engineering competition is not that much the operations company is somewhere either in Switzerland or somewhere in Europe or in US also works and then IP is a separate company as an IP holder also like in some of the nice locations like US, uh, some European license works, uh, Cyprus or British Virgin Islands. I also have a question for you. So, uh, if you, let's say that you are not a software engineer, so you have no skin right now to develop an app or whatever it is, would you hire someone out, uh, outside or outsource this process, or you will try to hire an engineer and give them, you know, and, you know, in your company and you can control or actually share with them what you think. Well, I, I think you have to have key competitions inside, and yes. in, and even hiring is, is, is not inside enough. So yeah. if I'm not if I were not a software engineer, yeah. I would definitely go and find a co-founder software engineer. Absolutely, I I believe that it's very hard to to make it work otherwise. How much do you think? Startup for me is it based? Um, if it is an app based startup, um, well, what, what, like minimum what is needed to basically to actually think that you can actually start working on the idea? Well, I think it's you know, you, you know, you can always choose whether to pay in money or to whether to pay in, in shares, right? And I, I think if, if you like if, if you have a really great idea and you can test it by motivating other people to join your company and if they have to join it like for the moon time coding or you know go and live for 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 their savings then you, you can only pay in in shares. If you like you in the other way around if like what would be the cost of developing let's say an average app, I would say it's like you can develop an app for several hundred thousand dollars and that would be like a really awesome application. That would be the cost to develop a really awesome application. And then again, if you don't have uh, enough competence in app development, then you still absolutely need somebody within your founding team uh, to, to have this competence. Okay, any other question? Okay, thanks everyone for coming and I hope that you, you want to say something? No. <laughs> I hope that you learned something. Before we go for networking, um, I would just say thank you to Lip for providing the, the venue.
Thank you again for coming and let's start.